The marine environment is a rich and largely unexplored reservoir of biodiversity with vast potential for food, health and biotechnology. The European Marine Biological Resource Centre, EMBRC, is a research infrastructure which aims to unlock the knowledge and innovation potential of our oceans. It enables researchers and companies to access marine organisms, expertise and experimental facilities to study them. Headquartered in Paris, EMBRC brings together 45 sites in nine member countries. We provide access to specialist facilities and services that enable researchers from academia and industry to study marine life and develop innovative solutions to address societal challenges like climate change and health and food sustainability. We support both fundamental and applied research, particularly for areas like biodiscovery, biotechnology, aquaculture, biodiversity and climate change research. EMBRC supported research has already led to novel, high-impact research in human health, product and medicine development and aquaculture, and it's helping us to fully grasp the crucial role of ocean life. EMBRC has benefited hundreds of researchers across Europe and beyond, delivering robust and efficient services and expertise to help users obtain the best possible results. So EMBRC is continuing to develop its services. We're working to start recording biodiversity at many of our sites using molecular techniques to put in place so-called genomics observatories. This will allow us to have a much better understanding of how our oceans function and their current health. In addition, we're increasing our bioprospecting capabilities to better support the development of new products and solutions from the sea. EMBRC is a single access point to remote and on-site services in Europe, supporting marine research and innovation across borders. Okay, so this was not the Assemble Plus uh, video, it was the NBRC video, but we'll get the, the other one later. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, Knowledge and Technology Gap Forum. Uh, this uh, particular one is where we're going to uh, debate uh, how research infrastructures can uh, serve better industry. And in fact, marine stations are often located in peripheral regions and can have a large impact in the local economy, uh, but at least potentially, but we know it's also real. Normally a relationship develops between institutes and local industry, often involving dissemination activities, technology demonstrations to attract interest from industry. However, in projects like Assemble Plus, or, or for example, AquaXL, which is another similar kind of project for aquaculture, the number of applications from industry is residual. There is often the argument that industry does not have time to travel to another country and spend some days doing the, some experiments. However, the concept of time is linked to value and perhaps we are failing to communicate the value of what's available to them. So to discuss this issue, uh, we have a panel of uh, three, uh, three uh, well, in fact, scientists, uh, with slightly different back background. Uh, Sophia Lezio, she is the biolab manager at Apivita. And Apivita is an international company uh, which deals with um, cosmetics, essentially. Adriana Yadora is uh, also uh, the chief biology officer of a spin off from uh, the Stazione Zoologica uh, in Naples. Uh, called BioSearch Bio SRL. And so she was a scientist in Sassanizeologica and now she is working in the private sector. Uh, and uh, Professor Christopher Bridges uh, is in University of Dusseldorf, but he also uh, has a spin-off uh, company, TunaTech, in the, in the area of aquaculture, working basically with tuna. Uh, and I would like to start by thanking uh, uh, the three members of the panel for accepting to participate, in particular because it was you know, quite uh, late invitations. Uh, you know, part of the problem was, of course, uh, the situation we are in. You know, this conference should have been uh, personal, but then it became online and we started things a bit late. But it's, very, it's been a very interesting experience. So I'm moderating uh, 
well, part of uh, this, uh, this conversation with Andrea Taralo, uh, who is uh, from the Stazione Zoologica in Tondorn and of course a member of Assemble. Uh, and I would ask the panel to introduce themselves, uh, perhaps better than I did, and, and particularly in their companies, and comment on some of the topics uh, that, that are related to this issue that I send them uh, by email to start with. And then we'll proceed with the discussion and ask also for the participants uh, to ask questions. When, when asking questions, first you should type it, uh, if not the full question, at least part of it, in the, in the chat so that we can see who it is. And then we ask for the person to verbalize the question. So thank you very much. I would like to start by asking Sophia uh, to, to make her introduction. Hello, Adelino. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> I would like to I have some slides that I would like to share with you. Uh, so I'm the head of uh, the biochemistry lab in Apivita. I'm responsible for the research uh, in raw materials so as to uh, identify uh, the promising agents uh, to be incorporated in final uh, formulations. As Adelito said, uh, Apivita is an international company, a cosmetic company. Uh, it produces natural-based uh, cosmetics that are available in 35 countries uh, around the world. Um, I would like to present some of Apivita's um, activity in research so as to, to see how um, uses the research outcomes out of, uh, um, out of uh, European uh, project or national uh, project as well. So uh, Apivita's activity in research started in 1995, as, as you can see here, uh, mostly with national uh, research uh, projects in a collaboration with the University of Athens and uh, continue this um, research with, uh, by participating in uh, European projects um, up to 2020. And the outcome of this, as we can see, is um, are uh, aware, uh, two international and three uh, national patents, 10 publications in scientific journals, and 20 uh, new methods and RSAs uh, that RPVT is using in, uh, in the lab. Um, the patents and the uh, scientific publications are very important for Apivita as um, uh, we can create an interesting marketing uh, story out of it. This is um, another pro a European project that uh, I would like to, to present. Uh, it was based on Marie Curie um, Industry Academia Strategic uh, Partnership. It was called Algicom. It's the reason that I joined Apivita as well. Um, and uh, the, the project was related to marine biotechnology. From this project, we had an international uh, patent. Um, as it was the first time that um, a specific microalgae extract, the nanochloropsis gaditana, was used for first time in, in cosmetics. And uh, we had a new uh, cosmetic line for Apivita based on this uh, active ingredient uh, that was available in 15 uh, countries. Uh, these are some uh, scientific uh, publications out of uh, uh, an Horizon 2020 project, the TASCMA, uh, which is related to marine biotechnology, and also to and, and also another one in, uh, based on Marie Curie Rice project, the Algae 4 ab uh, We identify some very interesting uh, agents that uh, are going to be incorporated in our products in 2023 and 2024 and 2025. Uh, I would like to mention that one of these uh, publications uh, is a collaboration with CCMAR with a group of uh, Deborah, Professor Deborah Power. 
Also, um, I would like to just add a line some uh, in-house research that we do in Biochemistry Lab. So apart from the participation in European project, we have also in-house uh, research uh, exclusively funded by Apivita. One of these uh, was based on epigenetics and the, specifically the epigenetics effects of uh, vitis vinifera on dermal fibroclast. Uh, the results were really interesting and Apivita decided to incorporate this um, ingredient in, um, in, a cosmetic, uh, in a cosmetic line available in 30 countries. And another one uh, was based on uh, Peonia extract and it's focusing on human keratinocytes and in human epidermis in general. And uh, Apivita decided to incorporate this again to a final uh, formulation available in 35 countries. So that was the, uh, uh, the slides that I would like to, to share with you. Um, so now regarding the, if I can, if I have time, uh, sorry, I cannot hear you. Sorry, yeah. I, but, uh, I, I was ah. just, uh, no, yeah, you can continue. If I, okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> regarding the, uh, the, 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 um, the question, uh, the collaboration between industry and um, academia, I think it's uh, very important that, as I have already uh, presented, <laughs> um, I think that the industry, however, I think it's a challenge for both uh, sides. Um, I think that the industry needs to trust more the uh, research infrastructures of the academia in general. And a good way uh, to do so is by participating in European uh, research uh, projects. Uh, the Marie Curie Industry Academia Strategic Partnership uh, project support the development of a long uh, lasting collaborations via the exchange of uh, researchers. Um, according to my opinion and the personal experience on a Marie Curie, on uh, several Marie Curie uh, rise, um, I think that these projects are rather uh, beneficial for uh, developing a mutual trust between the industry and the RIs for uh, long term strategic uh, par partnerships. Um, uh, another thing that I would like to, to mention is that the RIs uh, need to be more aware of the industrial needs. And the way to, to meet this, um, this point is to, first to foster an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and like this, um, this can get greatly contribute to the reduction of the cultural divide uh, which exists between industry and uh, academia. And the last point that I would like to emphasize is that um, there are certain uh, research institutions that do have uh, staff uh, with active links uh, with industry. And on the other hand, there are several academic uh, spin-off companies, but do they really interact uh, themselves? I think it's essential to detect um, those researchers with these specific um, skills and to pull their knowledge transfer competencies. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Sophia. Very interesting points. Um, so I'll, I'll ask now Adriana to uh, continue uh, with her point of view on this. Okay. Let me see how I can share my screen here. Okay, so I've opened share screen. Now I, I've opened you, my, you my presentation. Yeah, can you see the presentation? Maybe this here. Okay. Yeah, that's so, it. And then you just click as usual. Okay. <laughs> this is a long presentation, but I'm only going to go through it very quickly and leave it to you because there might be information in here that might be interesting for- Yeah, great. That, that will be helpful. People that are participating, okay. So um, I'm, uh, my name is Adriana Yanora and I've uh, been uh, involved in, uh, in both sides of the story from, uh, from, the very, from let's say, I, I, my academic background, I was 
former head of the biotech department at the Stazione Zoologica. Before, four, well, four years ago, we started the spin-off by the CNR and the Stazione Zoologica for the development of new drugs, cosmetics, and nutraceuticals from marine biological sources, mainly microalgae because that is my area of expertise and I don't, okay. So the company model is it's registered as an innovative startup, which um, includes uh, um, both public research institutions with complementary and synergistic synergic activities. And the majority stake is held by four founders, institutional stake, very small is held by the CNR and Stetson It's a logic and minority stake is held by other persons directly involved in the activity of the company. Um, the operate the office, our operations are conducted at uh, the Stetson Zoologica, which you all know, and which is also the registered office at Putzwoli at the Institute of Biomolecular Chemistry of the Institute of the National Research Council near Naples and in Milan, Northern Italy, some offices belonging to Multimedica Scientific and Technology Pole. We currently have five employees in, uh, in working for us in these various uh, uh, offices, let's say. Uh, our mission is to develop new products of natural origin for biotechnological applications in the pharmaceutical, cosmetic, and not nutraceutical fields. We develop these molecules up to the proof of concept in the translational pharmacological models. And then, you know, the idea is either we sell or we are able to <laughs> find, you know, a, a, a support our own research during the development of the last phases in clinical research. The board of directors, um, other than myself, the chief biology officer, we have our uh, uh, CEO, president, uh, Rolando Lorenzetti, who is also scientific director of the ETEL Biotech Consortium. And uh, he's an expert in biomedical biotechnologies. We have Tiziano Croci, who is ex-scientific director of Sanofi Research Center in Milan and um, has uh, experience in drug development and, uh, and drug development. We have two representatives of the um, uh, Stazio, this representative of the Stazione Zoologica is uh, Fabrizio Vecchi, who participates in our board of directors meetings, and Maria Luisa Pompili from the uh, CNR. The other partners are all here working either at the Stazione or at the CNR. Special mention to Angelo Fontana, who's our chief chemistry officer. He is at, uh, currently research director of the Biomolecular Institute of the CNR with a very deep expertise in marine natural products chemistry and he is responsible basically for all of the most of the chemistry of our products that are being brought forward in our platforms. I won't go through the company organization I'll just say that the company has access to SZN and CNR proprietary platforms for identification of bioactive and added value products from natural sources such as the collection of marine protists, microalgae that produce biomass and spike library of extracts for screening purposes that are available to private and public customers and commercial contracts via confidential agreements and shared exploitation of results. Our portfolio, I'm just showing you our main portfolio because we are not just developing one, but developing several products at the same time, which is a good strategy, I've been told, because I just started on all this business four years ago. It's a good strategy to have in case one product fails. Okay, so our first product is a phar phar pharma. It's a, it's a vaccine, a patented vaccine adjuvant from marine microalgae, which is at a TRL level of five. 
We have a cosmetic product uh, with uh, skin regenerating products, a very high TRL level. Immunoblue, a new nutraceutical microalgal product with immunostimulant properties. And finally, a glycox um, auto autophage inducer anti-tumor candidate, which we are starting now to, uh, which is starting now to enter into preclinical trials, and we are therefore uh, filing for a patent for this. So our main product is Sulfavant. It's this um, uh, compound, which I won't try to pronounce. It has an international patent. Uh, it was originally derived from a marine diatom, Thalassocera westphalogi, and then, you know, like they synthesized it, improved the chemistry, stabilizing it and making it more active. And now we have a new patent for the improved scalable, scalable formulation and lower cost production for this chemical, which has been recently submitted. And um, this glycolipid derivative um, is um, used in the preparation of adjuvant. It's an adjuvant in vaccines, is suitable not only for vaccines, but also for um, cancer diseases, okay? So it basically helps to boost the immune system so that vaccines or chemotherapeutic drugs can be more effective. And we have um, a project by, uh, funded by the Re uh, Campania region in, in Naples, around Naples, that is funding adjuvant de sulfavant all through the preclinical trial phase, to clinical phase one as an anti-tumor drug and vaccine. So a vaccine for um, uh, uh, cancer therapies, uh, cancer drugs uh, involved in uh, melanoma and uh, um, colon cancer. I won't go through the market. You can read through these things after, uh, afterwards. Other applications of Vesufovant, we would like to also look for potential applications of Sufovant as a vaccine, maybe for COVID-20, for COVID-2019, uh, the SARS virus, but uh, we'll see. And um, now Skin Rep is our cosmetic product. It's also, it's a derived from a marine green algae Tetracelmis sweshika, which contains high levels of um, carotenoids, has strong antioxidant, anti-inflammatory repairing activity. And this cosmetic has just been launched on the market in 20, just before Christmas. And two more will be uh, uh, marketed before next summer. The market you can read upon, this is the first finished product, as you can see from uh, um, this microalgae, Tetracelmis sueshika. The other two products are a skin cream that should be coming out. This is urban, are called Urban Serum. Um, uh, this is a, an anti-pollution, let's say, serum. We have a face cream with uh, some uh, skin protective factor and lip repair uh, cream that should be coming out soon. Immunoblue is an extract from another tetracelmus, Sichui, showing a similar immunostimulant property to similar to that of Sufavant, and therefore it has an interesting potential to be developed as a nutraceutical product, and which is what we are trying to do right now. Also because tetracelmus chewy has been approved for human consumption. One of the problems is there, there are very few microalgae that have been approved for human consumption. And this is an area of research, I think, which needs to be better developed for industries because industries are ready to go into the microalgae community market, but there are very few um, species that they can work on. Uh, so the market for immunoblue and the, the last uh, compound I want to talk about is glycox. It's a natural glycolipid isolated this time from marine dinoflagellate. 
And in all of our in vitro studies, it shows anti-cancer activity, but no toxicity in healthy and primary cell lines. And uh, we're going to start preclinical tests on this very soon. And this is why we have filed for a patent on this. And I will um, close the screen now. Stop sharing, right? Okay. And uh, just briefly say what, how, you know, like address some of the problems you asked us to address regarding how science and research infrastructures can best serve industry. Well, as I've tried to show that um, research infrastructures can offer many advantages to SMEs, such as the case of BioSearch, that um, include not only lab space, facilities and equipment, this type of interaction, once appropriate access and charging mechanisms are in place, opens up new opportunities for industrial partners that would otherwise be inaccessible to them due to prohibitive cost of equipment and high cost of qualified personnel. Another type of uh, interaction is joint research projects with industry, which requires a dedicated funding mechanism, such as the one that Sophie mentioned just previously, because we also had a very good experience with a RISE project, a Marie Curie RISE project, which is a research and innovation staff exchange project, which finished last year, which allowed excellent, we were four um, academic partners and four uh, uh, SMEs. And uh, we, we, we found that there was excellent training opportunities with this type of funding opportunity that even led to eventually to the filing of a patent by some of the partners. So I think this type of, you know, like um, interaction is very important because it's not only important to have um, uh, 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 services and uh, 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 equipment, but you need people. And you know, like what's interesting is that from my experience is that there are a lot of scientists that have potentially good products that could be developed and brought to market, but they don't know how to go about this. So if you have industries collaborating with infrastructures, they can probably develop these products together. Now, having talked about the good parts of uh, the, the uh, story, I just want to mention that I think that one of the problems right now is that um, most SMEs and larger industries are not aware of EU infrastructures and what they can offer. Even I have difficulty if I have to look through the website, you know, for EMBRC and I look up, for example, uh, bioassay um, platforms, which is something I'm interested in. Very little information. Industry wants to see information up front immediately and how much it's going to cost immediately because most of the times they are outsourcing things or parts of their research to other biotech companies and maybe it would be more convenient for them to outsource these things to infrastructures if they knew what these infrastructures offered. So I suggest to try to have a person who is dedicated to um, the website and to contacting industries, maybe uh, setting up a workshop where these industries are invited to participate and see what research infrastructures can offer and how they can be modulated according to their needs. And I'll end here and uh, wait for my next turn. Thank you. Uh, that was very good. And uh, so, Chris, it's your turn. Thank you. Okay, let me see if I can find my... Here we go. So our company, Tunatech, sorry, let's go back one. Tunatech was uh, started roughly about in 2013. 
And based on a number of EU projects, and the idea behind it was to look at aquaculture in uh, tuna. And uh, my colleagues, as you can see here, this is uh, two of my PhD students together with uh, Shukreen Army, our CEO, who's a biotechnologist. Uh, we put together a company and we are um, offering then services to the industry, aquaculture industry in particular. And we are also designing and managing tuna facilities uh, worldwide. The idea is to provide services then for the industry itself then, or basically look at contacts in the system itself then. Um, this is just some of the areas where we've been working in. Sorry, let's go back one. Yeah, you can, you can uh, just yeah. click like a normal PowerPoint in the presentation. Yeah. Let's just go back. Can we go back one, let me think. If, if you click to, 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 to um, present it like, like normally, you are going to do that, yes, there. Yeah, I just want to go back to the other the slide previously. Oh, hold on. Mm. I think you can do it on your right. Sorry. Right. There we go. I've oh, got it. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, just on this page, we can just see then some of the areas where, we look, as we said, working on aquaculture of uh, tuna. These are tuna eggs and so on and so forth, generating then larvae and juveniles, and these are then spread out again. The other area which we're looking at at the present time is developing um, new technologies for diagnostics, especially in fish, species diagnostics for pathogens. Obviously in aquaculture disease is a big problem. At the moment, we're just finishing a project on uh, microchips. These microchips will be used then in aquaculture to look at pathogen levels in the water or in the actual species themselves. And the bottom shows you something quite new, which is a new idea that we have of sex discrimination in uh, sturgeon. Again, through uh, information published by colleagues of another EU project, the genomics, it has been possible to design a specific test now to determine sex in sturgeon. And this is very important then for the caviar industry. And at the moment, we are in, uh, in um, discussions then with caviar producers worldwide to roll out this test for them. And this is a, a large scale test, which we will be looking at. Now, Adelino asked us then to look at some of the questions. How can science research interests best suit industry? And I think they can best serve industry by preferring services, support and technology platforms, which are not available to industry as a whole. In other words, it's a resource which the industry itself does not have. And there are many examples of this, which I'll come to a bit later on then. So this is one way of getting industry involved in EMBRC and research infrastructures in terms of what they can look at. Is industry willing or interested in having access to research infrastructure facilities, equipment and resources? As far as we are concerned from Tunitech, industry works on two basic principles. One, the acquisition of scientific information on a specific technology to solve the need of society, in other words, basic research, and two, to transfer this scientific information into commercially viable enterprises which generate revenue. And this was in one of our projects, Transdot, the transfer of, let's say, aquaculture techniques developed as research projects to transfer this then to a worldwide uh, industry, in other words, to formulate, uh, let's say, solutions for the industry then. So if access to RAs will, provide, will aid in bringing either of these two principles together to fruition, then industry will be interested in using these facilities then. So one must look at it like this, that companies, first of all, look to see where they can gain this scientific knowledge. And as the previous speakers have pointed out, joint EU projects have been extremely good. SMEs working together with scientific uh, uh, institutes uh, have worked extremely well. In fact, in Transdot, it was almost 80% SMEs and just 20% academic institutes. And this was the premise on which the money was then actually awarded for the project. So this was encouraging SMEs then to join EU projects then. And I think any um, SME which is worth its salt really knows where there are um, 
where there is money available to join these types of projects. And many of the projects are very keen, obviously, to have a SME working together with them. And as we saw in the previous examples, this has worked extremely well, where pat patents have been developed and things like this to actually transfer the knowledge which is gained in a project into the industry itself then. But again, you, one has to balance this up with the fact that many of the SMEs do not have time to run scientific projects. In other words, they do not want to be a coordinator. And in many cases, the money, we've had some cases in some of our projects where the money provided by the EU to the SME was not interesting. In other words, they didn't want to have the money themselves, but in some cases we were forced by the EU to give them some money, let's say 10,000 euros or something like this. But again, this is, as we say, peanuts to very large companies who have uh, the access then to these technologies or to these platforms then. What are the industry expectations of research infrastructures? Industry treats any RI as a commercial proposition and therefore expects a professional approach from the research infrastructure. As the last speaker pointed out, it's also very important to have a clear plan of what you're going to be paying for then. So that they also plan to use this as outsourcing of a production step or a process to save either expenses as it would be more costly to provide their own facilities, for instance, research ship, um, hatchery, large scale facilities, molecular laboratories, specimen and material supply, let's say access to deep water sediments or something like this. So, or access to equipment and technology and protocols and knowledge not available to the company as it stands then. So basically what they're looking for, if they have the idea themselves, they can outsource it. And obviously, it, if the outsource has a very good business plan, then basically they will then fit into the company's needs for generating, let's say its product, which it can then put onto the market then. And this is, I think, very important, let's say aspect of the research infrastructure. What can it provide? As our last speaker said, it's no good having to search for everything. It must be there and very clearly presented to the industry what they really uh, are being offered then and for what price it is. Um, how can our companies needs? By providing something which is not universally available and can be only provided by a specific RI, for instance, access to material from the Arctic or the Antarctic or deep sea environment. This could also be a supply of eggs or larvae to aquaculture species, which are difficult to cultivate. And there are not only physical or material needs, as our last speaker pointed out, but also experience and knowledge of methodologies hands-on approach which are present in the RIs, which are needed for a particular process of generating antibodies or cell lines. In. So again, industry can profit by these contacts then to the RIs, but the RIs again have to present this in a very clear manner, what we can offer to them, basically. And there, as, we, as we say, there are many aspects of RIs which are available only to these RIs, marine stations, as we know, I've worked in many of marine stations all over the world, they have the specific attributes which are then important then. How important are the resources and technologies provided by marine? The question is, can be answered by, first of all, cost of alternative resources, either in house or outsource, and B, the lack of feasible alternatives in terms of time frame, finance and know-how. So the RI may have a wealth of trained or training potentials for students and researchers, as again was pointed out by the previous speaker. So this exchange then of this, uh, let's say human resource is again, extremely important then for industry because the industry itself cannot generate scientists. They can use scientists to generate information and from this information then go on to a business study. So this wealth of future, can be incorporated in an early stage into joint projects, which industry thereby giving both partners a win-win situation. So in other words, the research infrastructure helps to cover the costs of running this infrastructure and the platforms. And at the same time, then of course, then the commercial enterprise then gathers uh, information for its own basic use then. The last point then, what should the RH approach to a strategy that serves the community industry objectives? They must determine their own USP, their unique selling point as a strategy in the first place. And as our previous speakers have pointed out, if we know 
exactly what is available or let's say is on the market, then careful consideration can be made of this uh, internally and then consulting, let's say in consulting with external experts, one can discern, determine a business plan for the research in infrastructure. So the last point, I think the last question was asked, um, what schemes would facilitate industry use of RIs and everything? First of all, one could enable a stock taking review, and I think this has been done before, you, of each RI using a template to design to recognize the assets. And this is the important thing, the assets of every RI. And these assets could be divided into di different divisions, such as science, biology, technology, logistics, manpower, so on and so forth. And then provide a pipeline, and this is again important, or channel through which industry can make its requirements known. In our previous experience uh, with the company forum in Embrick, uh, it was clear at the outset, that both partners would need to profit from such an interaction, either financially or academically in terms of new knowledge, training and job generation. And at the bottom, I've just showed some of the areas where we've required external help from let's say refer research infrastructures. On the left-hand side, you'll see here, these are juvenile surgeons, which pro provided by a research institute in the north of Germany. In the middle, you can see these are a collection of uh, tuna eggs, which are again from a research infrastructure on Malta. And thirdly on Malta, this is a biofouling experiment to test actual materials then. So in these three different examples, we've used three different areas where we have been required, or let's say our work requires the involvement of a research infrastructure. So therefore, to close my talk, I would say research infrastructures have a lot to offer. It's up to them to make it available or let's make, make it obvious for industry to make these contacts with them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris. That was, uh, from all of you, very, very interesting and very illuminating, I would say. I think there are some common aspects uh, and uh, and I think Sophia talked something that um, immediately called my attention, which is this trust of academ academia. And uh, maybe I would ask a bit to, to elaborate a little bit more on this, although from the, 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 what uh, Adriana said as well, and from what Sophia said, uh, it seems to me that trust means probably working together, but uh, maybe you can say a bit more if this is what you were thinking or, or, or if it was something else. Yes, it was uh, work together, participating in European project that, uh, as everybody says, um, work very well. Um, I think uh, industry need, needs to participate in European uh, project, needs to be close to people that they are source of knowledge. Um, and I yeah. think... The, yeah, um, I'm just thinking, you know, a part of... It. One of the things that seems is that these kind of rice projects seem to be almost the equivalent of the Erasmus uh, program because basically you have this exchange between industry and, and academia. And although people are sometimes weeks away from home, uh, no one complains really about time. So I think access to infrastructures is not so much linked to time, but to some other factor and maybe some of the factors you mentioned, but uh, Adriana is, is, he wants to say something. <laughs> yes. yes, I totally agree. It's not a question of time, you know, like they find the time if there's interest. I think what, um, uh, it, you know, like the infrastructures are offering services and, uh, you know, equipment, but they're not offering this unique possibility of working together with scientists from these infrastructures to develop eventually products together you know like this would be important okay. yeah so that, that's it's an interesting thing because in some ways the way these kind of projects we have at the moment you know like a symbol they were not really designed in that way no uh, and, and okay, there are other other ways of doing it, 
And of course, the infrastructures can participate in those projects, and they do participate. Uh, but uh, but it's, you know, this, this transnational access uh, is not designed in that way. And, and, and perhaps, of course, if people are familiar, like, you know, like Sophia said, if they trust and so they know about it, maybe they are, they, they're ready to do it. But it seems that there is a mass of companies that are not really aware of, of the potential. I think it would be interesting, for example, to have a call from both sides, okay, from an industrial partner and, um, you know, like an infrastructure partner to develop something together mm -hmm. using obviously the facilities of the infrastructure and eventually also those of the, uh, of the industry when available. And so this might be an interesting way of getting them to communicate. And before that, I think that something radical has to be done to the websites that uh, you need, you know, like uh, people, dedicated people to work on these sites so that they place exactly what's available at the Institute in terms of platforms, and, you know, like, because companies are outsourcing what they can't do themselves. And they can outsource to RIs rather than companies. Maybe it costs a lot less. We don't know. Yeah, I think that the outsourcing is, a, is another reason. I mean, we often uh, do services for, for companies. Uh, basically, they, out, they outsource, for example, a, a feed company tells us to do some assays or whatever. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's another aspect. So Sophia, I don't know if I interrupted you, uh, in, so if you want to say something else. Uh, yes, I wanted, I, I wanted to say that it's very interesting. Um, another interesting point seems to me to be the fact that uh, industry needs to hire more researchers mm -hmm. that, can, um, uh, that can be exchanged with the researchers from the RIs. Okay, so uh, more, avail more availability of researchers. Yes. Yeah. So w w one of the things we discuss, in fact, we're going back still to this question, one of the things we discuss often is whether we should have calls specific, di specifically directed at, uh, at, at industry. Uh, I mean, Adriana just mentioned, you know, basically they need to know better, it needs to be more clear. Of course, our calls are very bland in a way because we say, well, okay, anyone who wants to come, come. Uh, but if we say, you know, biodiscovery, we have this opportunity, we offer this and that. And so we are more specific, uh, or maybe we have to give more examples uh, when we do the calls, uh, whether that would work somehow or, or, or to have chances of working. In some way, this goes with what uh, Chris said about, uh, you know, the unique selling point, because when you have a specific call, you have to advertise what you have more specifically. The no wants to answer this. Yeah, can I say something, Adelino? Yeah. Yeah, um, as, as I pointed out there, the previous call uh, where we had the, in Transdot, this was the first time that the EU had actually specified that the SMEs should take 80% of the, of the budget. And in fact, the industry did take it up to some extent but it was not this type of call was never repeated again uh, because I think um, as I said previously most of the industry were not interested in coordinating things and uh, say having scientific meetings they were mostly interested in, in, in gaining knowledge uh, uh, on the specific topic then mm -hmm. uh, and as, as, the, as the case in the um, work packages with aquaculture um, having a company forum to discuss let's say, getting researchers together to discuss with the industry certain aspects. This again, fell short because I think one should not say that the industry has a lot of time. Industry is obviously under a lot of pressure to make money. And yeah. we should not forget this. This is also a time, a time frame for them is extremely important. Obviously talking to scientists and collaborating with the scientists is excellent for generating new knowledge getting new ideas from other people. But don't forget, the more employers they have as researchers, the more it costs 
the more the cost of the product and so on and so forth. So personnel are also a bit of a question mark, but if they can recruit the help of the research infrastructures, in other words, their, uh, their manpower or their brain power, this of course is an excellent opportunity for them to gain something, not for nothing, but obviously to be a good collaboration then. But mm -hmm. again, as, as um, Adriana said, it needs to be upfront that people can find this type of information, what exactly, which platform and the details. And I think she's got a very good idea if you have a, let's say an officer or somebody who is a liaison officer between industry and that uh, research infrastructure. This person has a very important job to do. And I think the money invested in that position will be paid back uh, by the actual success of gaining industrial support. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I know Andrea, do you, Andrea, my colleague, yeah. if he wants any, ask any question at this point? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Adelino. Thank you to all the speakers. Very, very insightful points. Um, I, I was um, thinking about this uh, lack of trustability between Rice and uh, Smith. I, I think that the probably uh, from what I understood is that uh, there is a kind of lack of contact between the two, uh, let's say, environments. Um, this is again a point also for the uh, the lack of a specific web page for uh, for SMEs or a person that can target SMEs. But I, I was wondering uh, at what point of the in the industrial process uh, there is the need of of contacting a, a research infrastructure or an academic uh, person. Uh, if there is in the early development of the product uh, or uh, after that, or on the contrary, if there are some, um, uh, some points during the process where you really will, you will never contact Arise because you will never find um, what you're looking for in the, in the academy. And yeah, uh, also if, what are the main differences uh, between working in a, in a RI environment uh, on the basis of your experience, previous experience, and within uh, SMIS? What are the differences? And yeah, that, that, that was my, my question. Uh, if you have a point in this. Okay, uh, Diana, you, you are ready to go. I don't know. There are so many questions. <laughs> so, you know, like, I don't know where to start. Maybe I'll start from the last one, you know, like where, uh, um, uh, what's the difference? There's, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a difference, obviously, because you have to have an entrepreneurship type of mind. And you learn this when you work with people that are coming from the industry. Okay, this is was was my personal experience. I was pure academic, and you know, like had no idea I would start a spin-off company until four years ago. But then, you know, like this just opportunity came along, and so um, I think that uh, there it's 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 a very interesting opportunity that a lot of people that are in the academic um, world don't understand how important and how important it can be even for their own research, you know, like, and so I think that um, having a liaison officer who puts people, you know, making people connect is not only, yeah, is very important, not only making people connect with services and equipment, but maybe within these research infrastructures, I know that that the Stazione Zoologica, for example, that are people that have very good products, that they are more than ready to work with industry that they would like to bring to market. And, you know, like maybe they don't fall directly into the type of products that we are trying to develop. So, you know, like this is what I mean by having a, con a, a liaison officer that not only shows what kind of equipment, and 
Now, obviously, this is all very important. For example, for people that are doing marine biology, having uh, uh, material, having uh, uh, access to material from different sites and uh, maybe, you know, like uh, upscaling phytoplankton production in our case so that we can buy the phytoplankton from uh, an infrastructure rather than having to uh, build, buy, a, uh, you know, like have, uh, uh, grow it on our own or buy it from another company. There's so many, so many aspects. It's really difficult to answer your question because it really depends on the company. So, you know, like I think the most important thing is to have better information available for SMEs on what uh, infrastructures like, a, like EMBRC are capable of offering. Okay, thank you, uh, Adriana. I don't know if anyone else wants to, to step in. Uh, actually, I, after listening to what, what has been said, um, and I think Sophia made, made also a point at some point uh, when, when she intervened. Um, it seems to me that, edu well, first of all, in terms of the function itself of the, of the institutes, uh, but also in terms of uh, education of researchers, it's, we need to have people not just to do that kind of link that you are saying, linking to industry, but actually people that educate the scientists uh, in terms of you know uh, of the industry, what they need and so on. Basically, the idea being that to get the, you know these people aware that they can actually have projects in the industry. So we we can have scientists that do the basic science and science that do the basic science and go you know and work with industry and and so on. Uh, I think this is a you know it's something that would be I think very useful possibly is really this internal uh, education uh, because then it's they, they will go after companies to to partner uh, you know in the European projects and other projects so yeah. I think I think this is one thing that I you know you that I learned from what you you said in your your uh, interventions um, anything any any other point that you'd like to make yes I would like to make a point on that. And I fully agree with what we say, you, you said, um, Adelino. Uh, I think um, uh, our eyes needs to foster entrepreneurial uh, mindset. And when I say this, I was thinking about that and I was thinking uh, the Silicon Valley. And I was thinking that if those people were able to create such a high tech hub, um, the basis of, of this should have been an already established um, entrepreneurial mindset. And I mean with that, that uh, not all the researchers are, um, are interesting in, um, in industry. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Uh, but um, to build up an entrepreneurial mindset, it's, you cannot do it um, in a day. You need some time. And I think in Europe, we are a little bit um, behind on that. But there are some steps that you can do in a race. For instance, you can invite uh, research from industry to give, some, um, to give some lectures in your master classes that are related to biotechnology or to marine biotechnology. Um, of course, participation re in research, uh, in research uh, project is it's really important. Mm -hmm. um, I also would like to say that uh, it's true that the industry uh, needs to see a robust, already established uh, methods by the RAs. They are not going to spend uh, time on waiting um, uh, for you, <laughs> waiting for the amazing results. It's not going to be. Um, and I think that the innovative idea should come from the, from the industry because they have access to market demands and to marketing policies, and the RIs needs to support scientifically this idea. Mm -hmm. At least this is my uh, my idea from from the industry point of view. It sounds it sounds reasonable. Uh, 
I, I've, I'm going to ask uh, the audience to put some questions. So we have Riam Nagwib. Can you ask your question? You begin with Riham. Who do you want to go first, Adelino? Well, Riam, Riam was first. Where is he? <laughs> Maybe he's not there. So, on the Uwebe, go ahead. Yes. So, to uh, all of you, how important is it for you as a company to work with research infrastructure and or scientists that are close by, let's say, in your vicinity, in your neighborhood or region? Wants to answer. <laughs> Was that clear? Yeah, sure. Okay. Shall I? Shall I just? Uh, okay. F from our point of view, it's um, it's good to have a university right next door where you can go, and if you have a question or you have a problem, you can go to it. But many of the re research infrastructures, as far as the marine facility, of course, are very far away from Dusseldorf. So therefore, for us, it's not a problem if we go to, let's say, we go to Malta or we go to Tenerife or somewhere like that. We're we're quite international in that respect. But I'm sure uh, Adriana has. Uh, closer contacts, uh, closer to home, let's say, put it like that, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yes, in, in my case, it's right in home, basically. I don't know, Sophia, what her case is, but I showed it, as I showed in my presentation, you know, like our, our laboratory, we rely on the laboratories at the Stetsinitzologic, at the National Research Council, and in Northern Europe. Uh, Northern Italy, sorry, in Milan. Do you want to add anything else? Or? Yes, yeah. we, have, uh, we have both. Of course, it's easier to collaborate with uh, RIs in, in Greece <laughs> because I can meet them, of course, easier. But uh, we have uh, international collaboration as well. Uh, Adelino, can I just make a point? Sure. Uh, to the uh, talking about. Um, Let's say the schooling of the uh, of the research infrastructures in Düsseldorf. We have a we have a chair of ent entrepreneurship, which was started about ten years ago. And all our students, all the biology students, are, have let's say all the classical entrepreneurship tools, workshops, and so on and so forth, which they can attend free of charge and things like that. So, in other words, you have to start early to let's I wouldn't say indoctrinate your PhD students, but to give them the tools these soft skills, they need exactly what Adriana said. They need these soft skills later on when they start thinking about research projects, and let's say the commercialization of these research projects. And for the research infrastructures, obviously if the liaison officer has some idea about these soft skills, exactly writing the business plan and so on and so forth, commercial planning and things like this, this would be ideal in terms of providing the information at source then. Thank you. Good. May uh, I, Nick, Nicholas, are you, you want to say something, Wewe? Yeah. yeah. Because in my experience, if I have gone through some experience with uh, companies, often when, when it comes to picking your brain, the, the, the background knowledge, the expertise, they don't mind where it is wherever in Europe or abroad. Uh, so people from Sweden came to me to ask questions, to uh, show things. But when it then comes to the practical hands-on things they want to do in the lab, they found it more convenient to uh, a Swedish persons to work with Kristineberg Marine Station. And that was nearby. Okay, Nicholas, that's someone from Kristineberg. <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, my question is, I, I, having hosted both, both Chris and Adriana from the panel, uh, at Christina Berg, uh, I know you are very familiar with, with the research infrastructure and with the scientific community. Uh, but how, and I guess Sophie also has a, a fair um, and a very good uh, scientific background as well. But how do we, uh, how do you think we should contact SMEs and companies with lesser scientific background and knowledge? Okay, can I answer that? I think that, you know, like, for example, right now, there are a lot of clusters in Europe. 
that are doing exactly that, that are mapping research um, industries in their various territories and mapping the type of activities that they do. And I know that this is going on with a cluster, it's called Big Cluster, Blue Italian Growth Cluster in Italy, which started last year. But I know in Portugal, there's a, a cluster that's been going, there are many clusters in Europe, okay? And these clusters all are trying to do the same thing is to map industries and what they do so that at least we know who to target. <laughs> Okay, once this, these maps become available, then for example, for ENVRC or the marine, let's say clusters, it will be much easier to see what kind of, you know, like industries could be interested in uh, ENVRC and contact them directly and send them brochures, invite them to workshops, you know, like uh, um, generate projects, like I was mentioning before, you know, like a double project where you put together the researcher from the infrastructure with the industry, sort of matchmaking, um, so that they can try to develop something together. For example, that's how, that's how the RISE projects were, were working. There was this group from Portugal, a small company. I think they're called C for Us. I think you know them, Adelino. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I know it's, it was a student of mine years ago. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and they were interested in painkillers. Okay, so you know, like they were traveling around and uh, trying to find new pain, new products to alleviate pain, which they eventually did find, and. Uh, they are now, you know, like uh, putting in a, a patent on this. So, you know, like it depends, you were talking about the type of subjects, you can target different subjects, anti-cancer compounds, immunostimulants, a nutraceutical, a cosmetic. So, the, which tries to match people from within the RIs and uh, eventual companies that might be interested in developing these products with the research infrastructures. Yeah, they got they got those uh, analgesics from yeah from uh, poisonous snails. Yeah. And um, so, okay, thank you very much. I don't know, Nicholas, wants to add something else or? Uh, I can I can add just just a short question. Do you, um, we have at Christineberg recently started to collaborate more with with like so to say middlemen. <clears throat> Uh, usually research uh, institutes uh, working already more with uh, uh, with the companies and inviting them to the to the Christineberg station instead so so we con we contact the middleman or person uh, gender neutral word uh, so so that they get more no knowledge about the about the station and the infrastructural services we offer uh, so that they in the, in their turn uh, makes industry um, aware about the stations. Uh, do you think, is, is this a way other countries are working as well? And do you think that's a good way forward? I, th I think uh, if I answer that question to start with, um, yeah, I think that's the kind of things that people are trying to do. But what Adriana said is, of course, uh, very, you know, it's a good option and, and uh, sometimes, I mean, it's there. Uh, the, you know, I think in Portugal clearly the cluster from you know the marine cluster uh, is is clear our target. I have to say, although we are members, I haven't really used it that much, but uh, I should change that that for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> um, so there, I've got there's a question. Uh, it's not exactly in the spots, but it's Ma Mariarita Caricciolo. She she can ask the question. The PhD student. Hi. Uh, yeah, it's a bit uh, a opposite question of, because you talked a lot about how industry can engage with students, but how can it happen also the opposite? How students can engage with those industries? Because we don't know them at all. We live in a context of research for three years. I'm a third year PhD student, so we just let's say closed in our um, with our collaboration that we do, but to go outside and 
and know the industries and uh, know how we can uh, how we can approach uh, people that work in this industry to to have some contact and to maybe go to work for an industry in the future. Yeah, I think that uh, Chris actually mentioned, you know, the yeah. the teaching of uh, of, of uh, you know these soft skills as, as one one step in that direction. But Chris, maybe you have more experience on this. Yeah, I mean, I think basically what we try and do is because Dusseldorf is a long way away from a lot of these research infrastructures that we. We try and encourage our bachelor and master students then to join the industry. And for instance, a lot of the aquaculture um, research infrastructures in the north of Germany are dependent upon bachelor and master students for running experiments. And again, the contact with the industry is normally, as, as Adelino knows very well, if you have, let's say, it's a, a food company, they have a new, let's say, um, uh, addition to their diets and they want to te test this. Now to do this themselves is very expensive to have their own facilities and their own f and so on and so forth. So most of them, and this is I think you can just say for most of the food industry, this is outsourced then to external RIs then. And basically the student can get into contact. We've just had a student who's been working for, for Coppens, basically doing a, a food trial and then Coppens Afterwards, after he'd finished the food trial and completed his master's study, offered him a job basically to carry on working for them. So again, it's if you in the for any student in the early days, if you can get into contact either through his supervisor or through the refer, research infrastructure with industry itself, which are let's say growing algae or doing something like that on a large scale or scaling up, then it's a perfect opportunity to them to get into the job market then afterwards then. And I think, I mean, basic research is great, but again, if you can get it more into the applied area, then obviously your possibilities of getting employment later on are a lot easier then. So it's a sort of play doy aid to try and encourage industry to take part in the RIs, but at the same time, as, as Adelino said, try and use the student power, which is there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So Simon, you would like to make a comment? Can you go ahead? Yes, hi everyone. I'm Simon from Elat, although I'm based in Jerusalem. Um, those of you who've been to Elat, I'm sure would appreciate the warm winter weather there. Um, <laughs> just a few comments here. There are some contradictions that we have, we have to face. And um, in the case of EMBRC, we are a distributed infrastructure as are most of the European in infrastructures that have been set up as ERICs. And therefore we provide access, a certain percentage uh, of access to our sites um, on an equal basis with anyone else. So th that is the sort of the basic uh, uh, agreement. Um, and because they're, they're distributed and because it's only a percentage of access, um, we have a higher authority, which is our marine stations are part of another institute or university, uh, et cetera. And they have their um, administrative regulations concerning use of, that, of the infrastructure that we're offering. So if a company says, gee, I want to come to a lot, study the coral reefs, because maybe I can develop a new kind of sunscreen, okay, and using the corals as a way to to find out how they protect themselves against environmental stress, uh, et cetera, um, then they don't just show up at our station and talk to the director and say, hi, I'd like to come by and use your facilities um, <clears throat> because it's a commercial company. It's not a research co company. And therefore they have to apply through our, what's called our university or tech transfer company um, to sign an agreement. Uh, because the researcher doesn't get the money for using the labs, his lab or her lab directly, or the infrastructure goes into an account where everything with, an, with a contract and everything is stated and the, um, the work package, the work to be described is, is outlined and the commitments and obligations of our, our uh, access provider. Um, and there are agreements, some things are service. You just simply want to have something done, please do this, send me this, whatever. There's a contract for that. If you want to do something which has more commercial um, uh, applications involving a researcher or involving some kind of possibly joint research activity, 
then you have IPR agreements, the contract changes, and um, there might be royalties, shared royalties, etc. So this starts getting into a, um, a more, not more complicated, but into a more realistic way of how companies and let's say universities infrastructures will have to deal with. Um, if you're doing bioprospecting, um, why would any infrastructure just go and do some work and give samples, et cetera, and basically do the project without being compensated? Um, now our tech transfer company of the university is one of the first to be established. This is at Hebrew University in the world going back in the 1960s. Uh, they had some remarkable successes. Uh, the best one not being in marine science, but in artificial intelligence. If you know about self-driving cars, well, that was developed as a big company called Mobile Eye, which was sold recently by the university to Intel for over $15 billion. That's B, not an M. Okay, and that was a very successful one through the tech transfer company. Now the tech transfer company does the marketing, does the promotion. Um, we have hundreds of Hebrew University scientists who are listed officially in their university tech transfer company is available for doing certain kinds of work and their expertise. As you said, that Chris and Adriana, it's kind of an inventory. Who's doing what, where, um, what can you find, what's being offered? And who do I talk to? And that was work that I said very, very well. Now EMBRC is just the headquarters. They don't have the money for that kind of resources. We can steer people, organize things and make that inventory of all our members and operators transparent and more easily accessible and to direct things. Um, and uh, that is the advantage of having this kind of research infrastructure as being a, a network that people can contact in a sort of one-stop office. Uh, and that's how research infrastructure would develop. In terms of industry, as Adriana mentioned, nobody knows who are the, who are the players, who's doing what. A large company doesn't really need anybody. It's the small and medium enterprises which don't necessarily have the facilities, the people, the money available uh, to, to cover things. Um, and um, uh, but, but therefore, we need a kind of inventory of companies also. Now, I've already suggested this to the EMBRC, saying we have to market, uh, find out who the market is. And if we have to do it ourselves, well, we have to do the searching, contact them, make sure they know we're available. And also, I've suggested that we have a um, kind of a, um, an expo, a marine, marine expo of our own, where we then present our stations, our operators, facilities, one place where they're virtually, okay, as Adolino basically is doing now, we're all presenting our stations um, and companies to see what the products are and one-on-one -on -one discussions, um, which are uh, much better than sending a brochure uh, around um, because you, you know, those five or 10 minutes of discussion, you know whether there is an opening or not and what they can and what they can do. So I think this is sort of a, a kind of a, um, a strategy that we have to consider or look at and a viewpoint of what an RI is, at least in marine science, um, and how do we best um, uh, present ourselves as a research infrastructure and uh, also how do research infrastructures find us. So I think I'll end my comment there. It's uh, a bit was a bit long uh, and um, I'm sure other questions that will be asked. Thanks. Thank you, Simon. It was good points. Uh, I don't know if the panel wants to comment on what Simon just said. No, no, I, I think I, I think uh, I think we should certainly agree exactly what Simon said. I mean, he, he brought up many points, uh, especially about the inventory. And uh, I think the other the other point is that obviously the more deep you go into relationship with a company, then. As he pointed out, there are contracts to be signed. There are IPR rights. I, I notice on Assemble, Assemble says specifically when you apply for a grant, then that the IPR and the results all stay with the company, which is one thing companies obviously are worried about, that their research is going to be uh, stolen by somebody else or whatever. But again, there are points about royalties, about patents. Adriana knows exactly how this works, how patents are generated. Um, this is all, it, it becomes, obviously it becomes more and more complicated as you go deeper and let's say 
how more important the discoveries are than for the industry itself and in terms of what's coming out. So uh, this is something to be obviously to be thought about. And obviously, as I said in the very beginning, one has to have a professional approach in terms of the research infrastructures. Yeah. Done, yeah. Okay. Any, any more comment? There is uh, Andrea Ramsack uh, says that certain big pharma companies have regular meetings with students, which is in, in response, response, which, and this might also be a good way for REs to show services. I don't know, Adriana, do you, uh, Andrea, do you want to say anything else? Um, yeah, thank you, Adelina. Uh, I'm working on a small partner in Assemble Plus in Marine Station in, in Piran, and I totally agree with Simon and his thoughts because the relationship uh, actually working with uh, companies is very complicated and it's not so straightforward and easy, like uh, provide services for academia. But I think this is uh, very important. And uh, if I speak in the name of a small marine station, I think that we have to work through research uh, infrastructure. So this helps us to put together uh, services, our products, so that would be only one point when the uh, companies can find services which are maybe also interesting in, in small or, more, or, or some more remote places. This is one, one thing. So it will be more visible and much easier uh, to search and find uh, services. Other thing is what is also very crucial is that liaison officer is actually quite important person. So it has to have quite wide knowledge and also those soft skills to connect people and actually find potential uh, collaborations uh, within the uh, uh, access providers. Um, so, so I think that the research uh, infrastructure should be promoted more and all the partners should be promoted through research infrastructure. Yeah, I, I agree totally. We have to be even better at, or uh, well, much better, as Adriana says, at communicating and, and, and with not just websites, but also in our campaigns to, to make known what we can offer. Uh, I don't see any more questions. I, I would ask uh, the panel if they want to, you know, make any last comment because it's, uh, you know, we're getting to the time to finish uh, this uh, session. Um, if not, I have to say, I think this was very informative. Uh, I enjoy very much this, this conversation and, uh, and I think it will be very useful for us because, uh, you know, we, we you know, as project managers, let's say, we have one side of you saying, you know, you have to have companies, uh, you know, participating, getting involved and so on, but it's not that easy. Uh, and the numbers are there. I know Aqua Excel, they have even a committee uh, um, advising uh, companies and, and also to, uh, to try to get the results uh, into companies and so on. But uh, I'm not sure if they are being very successful. I'm part of Aqua Excel, uh, but, uh, but I'm not totally sure that it's working that way. Certainly, I think we had very good ideas here uh, and then clarified you know, some things. Of course, this is just one sect, well, one, you know, a group of people that are actually highly educated, uh, that come from academia, academia most, most, you know, most of you. Uh, and, and so there are other, other aspects probably that one has to consider, uh, but, uh, but I think this certainly helped a lot and, uh, and we learned from it. So thank you everyone for, for, for actually having you know, come to this session and, um, and uh, hope that you can continue enjoying uh, the conference. We have later on uh, a few lectures uh, with people that used uh, the, you know, the, um, the the various marine stations, uh, and, uh, and of course, they, most of them are from academia, uh, but uh, but still very nice work. So I hope you'll be you'll be back later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adelino. Take care. Thank you, everyone. At NHBS, our purpose is to support those who are passionate about wildlife, ecology and conservation. 
We stock a variety of books and equipment to suit the needs of marine conservation professionals and our innovation and research team are here to help develop custom products for any project. We are happy to provide advice and to support you before, during and after your purchase. Visit nhbs.com today to find out more. First Class Scientific Research relies on effective, convenient access to tools, facilities and data. Assemble Plus is a European Union funded research and innovation program with a consortium of over 20 partners that integrates key marine research facilities across Europe and beyond, offering access to top-tier research infrastructure through a competitive application procedure, evaluated on the basis of a feasibility assessment and research excellence. Whether from academia, industry or policy, through its easy and straightforward application process, Assemble Plus provides scientists with on-site or remote access to biological resources, varied ecosystems, experimental facilities, technology platforms, e-infrastructure and expertise, and provides lodging and catering support over the course of their placement. Assemble Plus also performs its own networking and research activities, ranging from interacting with new users and businesses, to cryobanking marine organisms, to providing diving services for researchers. Over the course of the project, as well as providing access, Assemble Plus aims to strengthen transnational and multidisciplinary networks, create public-private partnerships, enable new technologies and services, upskill researchers, and improve the long-term sustainability of Europe's marine biological stations. So, if you are a researcher in need of access to marine infrastructure, such as laboratories, equipment, or any other provision, Assemble Plus welcomes proposals for access on a rolling basis from the 29th of August 2018 to the 30th of October 2020. For more information about the project and call for access, please visit www.assembleplus.eu.